Thank you, Dr. Bennett. If marriage and family is not political, I don't know what is. <laughs> Our second speaker for this afternoon um, is Dr. William Cavanaugh. Dr. Cavanaugh is research, uh, senior research professor at the Center for World Catholicism at DePaul University here in Chicago. He's the author of five books and editor of two more. Uh, his, many of you have probably read his seminal book, Torture in the Eucharist, Theology, Politics, and the Body of Christ. His most recent books include uh, The Myth of Religious Violence and a wonderful new book, Migrations of the Holy. Dr. Kavanaugh is going to give, talk to us about citizen and consumer, a theological view of the relationship of the state and the market. Welcome, Dr. Kavanaugh. Thanks, George, and uh, thanks to George and Jeff for the invitation to be here. I've been here once before and uh, had a wonderful time. I've really um, gotten to have a, a real fondness for Wheaton and its students. I continue to be impressed by the students. I had um, dinner last night um, at the house of Norm and Sharon Ewart, and uh, me and about 50 students, and it was uh, a wonderful uh, occasion. One of the things I remember about the last conference is one student who came up to me and said, that he'd recently been married and his wife told him uh, that on his honeymoon he could bring one book and he brought torture and Eucharist. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, this is not a good sign for the marriage. I don't know. Um, but, um, so today I'm going to talk about, um, I actually changed the title of the talk. I gave, you know, you, you agree to do something like this a year in advance and you give some generic uh, title. But um, as I sat down to write the paper um, after breakfast this morning, I decided to um, change the, uh, the title and, and narrow the focus a little bit. Um, are corporations people the corporate form in the body of Christ and get at the relationship between state and market uh, through that lens? In January of 2010, the United States Supreme Court handed down its landmark decision in Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission, which overturned limits on political expenditures by corporations and unions. And the decision was immediately hailed and decried as a major turning point in US law, not simply because of the decision reached, but because of the way the majority argued, corporations and unions were clearly regarded as being the subjects of speech. They could speak like human beings. Although the Supreme Court had long given some First Amendment protections to corporations, the majority in Citizens United argued against the law's ability to make any sort of distinctions among speakers in First Amendment cases. And reaction against the decision has tended to echo the conviction of Justice John Paul Stevens' furious dissenting opinion. The speakers in this case, quote, are not natural persons much less members of our political community, end quote. Corporations are not people is the refrain of politicians, books, websites, blogs, etc., dedicated to overturning Citizens United. Only individual human beings are people and therefore only individual human beings should be the subjects of a democracy. Now today I'm gonna to take issue with that type of criticism from a theological point of view because the fact is that corporate personhood is central to Christianity. The people of God and the body of Christ are corporate persons, recognition of which should prevent Christians from thinking that only individuals are actors in the world. At the same time, however, I think that Citizens United is a disastrous and distorting decision, not because it recognizes corporate persons as such, but because of the kind of corporate person it privileges, the business corporation. So to critique Citizens United, we must go deeper than trying to privilege the individual actor in the marketplace of ideas and critique instead the integration of politics and markets that stands underneath the distortion of these ideas of citizen participation. So I'm gonna begin with a brief look at bodies politic in the ancient world compared and contrasted with biblical views of corporate personhood and then discuss in modernity the simultaneous rise of states and corporations and why they fall short of a truly participatory politics so I'll look at the Citizens United decision in more detail at the end and argue that although the idea of a corporate person is coherent and important, 
The privileging of the business corporation is a distortion of the kind of communal body that the church is called to promote and enact. So first section, bodies politic in the ancient world. The idea of a corporate person can be found in the ancient Greek analogy of the body politic. Aristotle writes, quote, the state has a natural priority over the household and over any individual among us, for the whole must be prior to the part Separate hand or foot from the whole body, and they will no longer be hand or foot, except in name, end quote. So the polis, therefore, is not a human creation, but reflects the order of nature. It is both natural and prior to the individual, as Aristotle says. The individual receives fulfillment by participation in the polis, but that participation for Aristotle was not on an equal basis. The body analogy allowed for hierarchical relationships, just as the head governs the body so certain people are naturally fit to rule, citizenship was limited to propertied men. Women, children, slaves, resident foreigners, and many laborers were excluded. Aristotle was not a Democrat in the modern sense because he did not think that the demos had either the leisure to commit to informed decision-making or the means to hire someone to represent them. Democracy in the ancient world excluded the working class. It was taken for granted that to be a citizen, one would not, could not be dependent on others for employment. So in other words, contrary to what we've been thought to think today, one cannot have democracy in a class-divided society. I think he's probably right about that. Corporate personhood is inflected differently in the biblical tradition, beginning with the creation of all human beings in the image of God, the image of God in Genesis 1.27 seems to apply to the whole human race. In the image of God, he created him, Adam, singular. Male and female, he created them, plural, which is why many versions of the Bible translate Adam with a corporate noun like humankind. Indeed, the concept of corporate personhood is a dominant theme throughout the Bible. Israel is regarded as God's son, Exodus 4.22, Hosea etc. The suffering servant in Isaiah is Israel as corporate person and or the Messiah who takes the collective sins of all onto his body. The sense of corporate personhood is crucial, of course, to Paul's soteriology. According to Paul, Christ is able to undo Adam's sin because Christ, like Adam, incorporates the whole human race. Quote, for if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. Uh, Romans 5.12 and following. The reality of corporate personhood is fundamental to the thought of the patristic writers as well. As Henri de Le Bac explains, quote, the unity of the mystical body of Christ, a supernatural unity, supposes a previous natural unity, the unity of the human race, so the fathers of the church delighted to contemplate God creating humanity as a whole, end quote. So, so this monogenism, as de Le Bac calls it, was at the core of the reality of the body of Christ. Christ comes to restore the original unity of humanity by gathering all into his body. His incarnation was not just a corporatio, a corporation, but a concorporatio, as St. Hilary says. Augustine famously describes this as the formation of a different kind of city, what Aristotle would call a polis, the city of God, which is formed by the unity of people around the altar in the becoming of the body of Christ. So when the early church borrowed the Greek term ecclesia for itself, it took on some of the resonances of the Greek body politic, in which the ecclesia was the gathering of all those who had the rights of citizens in the city state as opposed to the smaller group of elected officials, the, the boule that made up the kind of council. The church thus claimed to be more than a club organized around private interests, but a fully public gathering concerned with the whole of life. At the same time, it was not the earthly polis, but an anticipation of the eschatological gathering of the people of God. According to Gerhard Lofink, the origin of Ecclesia was ultimately not the Greek city-state, but the day of the assembly at Mount Sinai when the Israelites received the Decalogue. Paul's strong identification of the ecclesia as the very body of Christ is no doubt indebted to Greek concepts of corporate personhood in the body politic, but at the same time it's a radical departure from Greek ideas of citizenship and class. 
Christ's crucified and resurrected body gathers the whole of humanity restored to the primordial unity in which it was created. The distinctions with which Greek concepts of citizenship operated simply disappear. Quote, there is no Jew or Greek, there is no slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ's, Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.28, of course. As the image of the body makes clear, there remains differentiation among the members, but this means that equality is not mere formal equality in which all are treated as the same before the law. In fact, differentiation produces a kind of attraction among the members. For as Paul tells the Corinthians, the eye realizes that because it's not the hand, it needs the hand. What holds the body together is not mutual interests or rights or fear of external enemies, but agape, love. This love is the fruit of the Spirit in whom all were baptized into the one body of Christ. Not only are the weakest members not excluded from citizenship or membership in the body, but there's a preferential option for the weakest in the body. Quote, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. Paul, uh, uh, of course, 1 Corinthians 12, um, all of these quotes. Paul takes the body analogy even further by implying that a kind of nervous system connects all the members for, quote, if one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. The corporate nature of the church is further intensified beyond the Greek model by the Eucharist, which serves to bind the members together into the body of Christ by an act of bodily consumption. The body of Christ was identified with both the corporate person of the church and the food upon which the members of the church fed. By eating the Lord's body, we become assimilated to the Lord's body, consumed by what we consume, we do not thereby eat ourselves because there is no self properly understood before we enter into communion with God and with one another. As the work of John Zizoulis makes clear, the patristic anthropology is not one in which pre-existing individuals subsequently enter into communion with each other. It is instead the case that we become who we really are only by entering into that communion, being is not a mere biological fact, but an ecclesial reality. So uh, Zizoulis' book, Being as Communion. What the body of Christ inaugurates, therefore, is a new type of sociality, one that is bodily but simultaneously eschatological. Its being is received from another God, and so it is aware of the other in its midst, the stranger and the poor one who is the personification of Christ, as Matthew 25 makes clear. There's nothing new about forming associations of like-minded people based on common interests. By the time of Jesus, associations in the pagan world were common. They were social clubs based on a particular trade, fruit merchants, for example, or funerary societies to ensure each member a decent burial, or societies based on the cult of a particular deity. They shared meals together. They achieved a sense of belonging. They talked about brotherly love, sisterly love. But what made the church different was not only its choice of an explicitly public and political term like ecclesia, as opposed to terms like koinon or collegium that designated associations, but its transgression of ordinary social boundaries to include women, men, children, slaves, Jews, Greek, rich, poor, all within the same gathering. There was originally meant to be only one church presided over by the bishop in each city instead of many parishes into which people could self-separate. The Eucharistic assembly therefore gathered people from across all kinds of natural and social divisions. The Acts of the Apostles makes clear that economic relationships were not exempt from this breaking down of barriers. The early Christians are said to have no private ownership but rather share all things in common, taking special care of any in need. Uh, Acts 2 and also in Acts 4. Such was the ideal anyway. The account in Acts is no doubt somewhat romanticized. And as Paul's scolding of the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11 makes clear, the ideal in practice was not always so. But the type of corporate person that the body of Christ called into being was clearly a challenge to existing social 
economic and political stratification. So on to the next section, corporate bodies in a market society. In the medieval period, the body of Christ continued to be a powerful image of the corporate nature of human relations. The body of Christ produced a relation of agape among the members that differed from the Greek and Roman body politic and suffused the body with a mystical sense quite alien to the classical world. The body of Christ also radically divided the political loyalties of Christians. Among the Greeks, there could be no doubting one's membership in the body politic, although one could question this law or that tyranny. One's membership in the polis was a necessary condition for one's development as a human person. The Christian, on the other hand, could have doubts about political participation because she belonged to another type of body, a body that was already a colony of heaven. Christian ideals and Christian realities were not the same things, however, and the corporate nature of the Christian community was recruited into use for more hierarchical and uniform, uniform visions of society. John of Salisbury's Polycraticus in the 12th century, for example, draws on Plutarch, not Paul, to establish the image of the political community on the analogy of a human body, with the king as the head, priests as the soul, the hands as the soldiers, the stomach as the treasury, and the peasants as the feet. As Henri de la Bac famously documented, beginning in the 11th century, the corpus verum, the true body of Christ, increasingly referred to the Eucharistic elements on the altar and not to the church. The corpus mysticum came to refer to the church, but the sacramental and eschatological elements of the image were muted as the church became increasingly bureaucratized. The term corpus mysticum was increasingly used in a legal context to refer to the church's structure, which was seen as less of an effect of the Eucharist and more on analogy with human bodies. It became possible then to refer not to the mystical body of Christ, but to the mystical body of the church. And of even greater importance was the gradual migration of the concept of the, the mystical body to the nascent state in the late medieval and early modern periods, building on De Lubac's work, Ernst Kantorowicz's study, The King's Two Bodies, showed how the state borrowed theological body language to take on the trappings of divinity. So by the 15th century, jurists like Jean de Terre Rouge were referring to the mystical body of France what Wolin, Sheldon Wolin had found so politically promising about Christianity is also what he found so dangerous. Classical thought had conceived of political solidarity in a body pot. I'm sorry, I, I cut, cut, some, cut this paper down and il eliminated a reference to Wolin earlier on. Uh, Wolin talks about the, the fruitfulness of the division of political loyalties by Christians. Um, but he thinks what's dangerous about this is that this mystical union that Christians talked about eventually gets carried over into the, um, the modern state. He says, classical thought had conceived a political solidarity in a body politic, but never as a mystical body. Here's a quote from Wolin, quote, Christianity helped father the idea of a community as a non-rational, non-utilitarian body bound by a meta-rational faith infused by a mysterious spirit taken into the members, end quote. And that, unfortunately, that gets transferred to the nation state, spawning nationalism and all its ills. Now, in previous work, I've looked at this mysticism of the nation state. What I want to do now is look at the business corporation as another kind of body, one that arose in conjunction with the state and one whose power has now come to rival and in many cases has merged with the state. So what we see in the modern era is a new type of corporate person, the business corporation, which has taken on powers of speech. The rise of a market economy along with the modern state is often depicted in terms of the rise of the individual over against more communal forms of living that are associated with the medieval period. So the organic metaphor of the body was largely replaced by social contract theory in which pre-existing individuals band together to form a state and society based on mutual interests and mutual fears. Hobbes' Leviathan kind of bridges these two eras. Um, it's contractual but holds on to this uh, body uh, uh, image, the Leviathan as its artificial body. 
But in later political theory, the body, body analogy largely drops out. At the same time that the body analogy is dropping out of political theory, though, um, and the new science of economics is fixated on the encounters of individuals in markets, each pursuing their own interests, the primary use of the collective body language outside of the church becomes that of the business corporation, right? Corporation from corpus body, the idea of individuals coming together in a legally recognized body with rights and liabilities that transcend any of those individuals dates back to the Roman collegia. But what's new about the modern corporation, like the Dutch and British East India companies chartered in the 17th century, was their incorporation for the pursuit of profit on behalf of private shareholders. So the rise of the corporation was predicated on the creation of the capitalist and the wage labor. It's predicated, in other words, on class division, a creation that was in turn predicated on the liberation of the individual from the confines of the traditional social group. Medieval feudal arrangements, towns, guilds, clans, other bearers of local custom were swept away by the rise of the sovereign state as with one centralized political center and legal structure. The rise of market economies depended on the state and the establishment of standardized systems of law currency and taxation. All individuals were now in theory equal before the law and all were liberated to sell their labor or purchase the labor of others to deal with each other on the basis of contract, in other words, rather than as members of a social body. This process of freeing wage labor included dispossessing masses of individuals from control over their means of production, such as in the, the enclosure of common lands, basically the theft of common lands in the early modern period. Now, we're accustomed to telling the story of the simultaneous rise of state, market, corporation, and democracy as if they were all one story, but I think the Citizens United case demands that we consider the possibility that they are not all one story, the rise of corporate power is not the same as the rise of democracy, and in fact threatens democracy. As Charles Lindblom has argued, there is no essential relationship between democracy and markets. The reason that polyarchies, systems in which no monolithic elite controls the political process, are always associated with market systems has to do with the constitutional liberalism in which both polyarchies and market systems were born Liberalism, however, was not democratic in origin, but an attempt to protect and enlarge the liberties first of nobles and then of the merchant middle class. So the job of liberal states was and is to protect property and provide the necessary conditions for market competition. Popular rule was sometimes seen as an end toward the attainment of that liberty. But liberty and equality were often at odds, and when they were at odds, liberty has usually trumped equality, as in the case of Citizens United. This is made very clear by the judges in Citizens United, both the majority and the dissenting opinion. They agree that the First Amendment is designed to protect liberty, that is, the freedom to speak, but is not meant to equalize the power of those who speak. And in the longer version, a uh, quote from both the dissenting uh, opinion of Justice Stevens and the majority opinion, both agreeing that the First Amendment is not about equalizing speakers, it's about the freedom to speak. C.B. McPherson writes that, quote, liberalism had always meant freeing the individual from the outdated restraints of old established institutions. By the time liberalism emerged as liberal democracy, this became a claim to free all individuals equally and to free them to use and develop their human capacities fully, end quote. Despite this claim to equality, however, liberal democratic theorists accepted class division. The equality of visions was a formal equality before the law and not any deeper sense of equality. Quote, the first formulators of liberal democracy came to its advocacy through a chain of reasoning that started from the assumptions of a capitalist market society and the laws of classical politi political economy. 
These gave them a model of man as maximizer of utilities and a model of society as collection of individuals with conflicting interests. That's a quote from McPherson. Early theorists of liberal democracy did not give up on the goal of full democracy through equality, but they did their best to reconcile a competitive market economy with equality. John Stuart Mill, for example, saw liberal democracy as a moral project for the improvement of humanity that would progressively overcome class divisions. Mill saw that the current system was grossly unfair in that rewards were inversely proportional to the amount of labor a person did. But Mill thought that this inequality was only accidentally related to the market system. He thought that participation in the competitive market would allow the working class to develop its own human potential. But in the meantime, he thought, the elite should be given a disproportionate share of votes since in their present debased condition, the lower classes could not be trusted to vote in the interest of the common good. Mill at least had the virtue of recognizing that class division and inequality were a problem for democracy. The theorists of democracy in the latter half of the 20th century, however, beginning with Schumpeter, have tended to conflate the political and economic processes so that liberal democracy is envisioned on the model of a market. Any concern about class division and the improvement of humankind has tended to give way to a more ostensibly empirical model of all people as individual rational maximizers who choose political candidates as they choose salad dressing at the supermarket. Right? <laughs> so democracy is a marketplace in which elections register people's desires as they are. There is no overriding telos or common good. Each person chooses his or her own good based on his or her own preferences and individual preferences will inevitably conflict, so the market is the mechanism in both the economic and political realms that determines whose preferences prevail, with one important difference. In the economic market, minority preferences may still be met by some suppliers, niche markets. In the political market, there is no niche markets in a two-party system. It's winner take all, so the preferences of the majority always trump those of the minority. <laughs> The model of democracy as a marketplace is not, of course, the only model of democracy that's available. Uh, Jeffrey Stout has, has given another very interesting uh, model. But the Supreme Court takes it for granted. It's the dominant one. So both the majority and the dissenting minority in the Citizens United case repeatedly use the model of marketplace to describe the political arena. The majority argues that restricting corporate speech will impede the uninhibited marketplace of ideas. One of the precedents that Citizens United overturned, they write, had sought to prevent, quote, an unfair advantage in the political marketplace by using resources amassed in the economic marketplace, end quote. But the majority knocked down this attempted barrier between the two marketplaces by arguing that the court had already rejected as unconstitutional the goal of, quote, equalizing the relative ability of individuals and groups to influence the outcome of elections. Again, liberty trumps, uh, trumps equality every time. Quote, the First Amendment stands as against attempts to disfavor certain subjects or viewpoints or to distinguish among different speakers, which may be a means to control content. End quote. That's from the majority. The logic of the economic marketplace that more choices are better and no one can prejudge which choices are good is applied also to the political marketplace. Quote, there is no such thing as too much speech, as Justice Scalia has written. Justice Stevens in dissent also recognizes the, the legitimacy of the, quote, market for legislation but wants to create, quote, breathing room around the electoral, electoral marketplace of ideas in order to allow competition in that market to be more fair, end quote. The marketplace in Adam Smith's vision assumes supply responds to demand because many sellers respond to many buyers. The majority in Citizens United assumes that corporate persons have the same speech rights as individuals. Democracy is the process by which all speakers, including groups of individuals, have their say, and then the citizens or consumers 
choose which speech conforms to their preferences. The electoral system responds to consumer demand. One person, one vote. The problem is that the political market is an oligopoly. The buyer confronts not multiple sellers, but two, Republicans and Democrats. The sellers need not respond to the buyer's or voter's demands as they would in a fully competitive system. Demand is dictated largely by the sellers. It's true that the system gives one vote to each individual natural person, but the candidates and issues that are voted on and the information provided to the individual voter are largely determined not simply by demand, but by effective demand. In an economic market, the only demand that counts is the demand that's backed by purchasing power. Right? If you don't have any money, but you demand something, it doesn't really move the market. In an economic market, the person with a million dollars has a million more votes than the person with one dollar. And so it is in the political market. Money is speech. Those with a lot of money are much more effective at creating demand than those without. Where there is substantial inequality of wealth, in other words, there is no true democracy but competing elites with low citizen participation. The majority in Citizens United astonishingly uses heavy corporate spending on elections as evidence that the people are in charge. Quote, the fact that a corporation or any other speaker is willing to spend money to try to persuade voters presupposes that the people have the ultimate influence over elected officials." End quote. <laughs> the court therefore dismisses the idea that people will cease to participate, even though nearly half of them already have. <laughs> Wolin's view of American democracy is probably closer to the mark. I love this quotation. Quote, the citizen is shrunk to the voter, periodically courted, warned, and confused, but otherwise kept at a distance from actual decision making and allowed to emerge only ephemerally in a cameo appearance according to a script composed by the opinion takers slash makers, end quote. Now, early theorists of liberal democracy feared that giving the lower classes the right to vote would overturn the class system and result in chaos. But it never happened. As Wolin points out, Americans are apolitical but not alienated. They're patriotic and resigned or relieved, maybe, to turn over their civic obligations to the experts. Why? I think it has to do with the kinds of social bodies that have largely replaced the church in the modern era the first is the nation state. The mysticism of the nation state has tended to occlude any discussion of class divisions. We are convinced that we are e pluribus unum, one united from many. Policy debate shies away from any discussion of class. I think we just need to start talking about class in a theological context. Those who raise the issue of class are usually shouted down. They're accused of making class warfare which I think is kind of like accusing the fire department of arson because they keep showing up at house fires. You know? <laughs> um, so we rally around the flag and we support our troops so that we can ignore the brute fact that those who kill and die on our behalf come overwhelmingly from the lower classes. So the one type of social body, the nation state, the other type of social body whose interests have largely merged with those of nation state elites is the business corporation. And here too, corporations have succeeded in convincing us that their interests are not private, but public. The welfare of the whole society depends on the success of business. And so public officials are remarkably solicitous of business demands for favors, which include everything from direct subsidies to fighting wars for economic interest, right? It's the economy, stupid, as uh, Bill Clinton's little reminder said. Lynn Bloom quotes a DuPont executive as saying, quote, the strength of the position of business and the weakness of the position of government is that government needs a strong economy just as much as business does, and the people need it and demand it even more, end quote. Lynn Bloom comments, quote, the duality of leadership is reminiscent of the medieval dualism between church and state. So state and corporation, church and state. And the relations between business and government are no less intricate than in the medieval duality. 
end quote. Michael Novak has notoriously applied the suffering servant passages in Isaiah to, quote, the modern business corporation, a much despised incarnation of God's presence in the world. It's just almost breathtakingly blasphemous. <laughs> Naomi Klein, on the other hand, has documented a corporate chic in which the corporation is not despised, but branding creates a kind of salvific mysticism around corporate identities. Either way, if you believe Novak or Klein, corporations embody powerful social processes and in some cases affect a kind of mystical union among managers and consumers a charmed circle from which workers are largely excluded. Again, the issue of class has to be brought back in. Business corporations can and do serve social purposes in the pursuit of private profit, and Novak argues that business corporations are not just economic, but moral, social, and political actors. The problem is that when political discernment has been subsumed into a competitive market model based on preferences, rather than any substantive telos, or conception of the common good, there is no standard on which to judge which social purposes are to be pursued. Markets are designed for the maximization of preferences. In the absence of any equalizing considerations, those preferences with the most power win. And power in a corporate dominated society is based on class division. The fundamental divide between the owners of capital and those who have nothing to sell but their own labor the business corporation embodies class antagonism because the managers of the corporation understand their task as the maximization of shareholder value, which often comes at the expense of labor. One significant way of increasing profits is to decrease wages paid to workers. In the political sphere, corporations commonly use the profits generated by labor to support the interests of shareholders, often opposing the interests of labor. What we have then in our currency, so it's a fundamentally different kind of body, in other words. What we have then is our current situation. Patriotic assurances that the nation and the corporation enact truly social processes that bind us all together as one, combined with a reality of ever greater class division and political participation that is driven by and serves those with access to large amounts of money. Now, Justice Stevens makes a number of powerful arguments demonstrating the corrupting influence of corporate speech, but his main move is to claim that free speech rights are meant to protect individuals, not corporations. Corporations are not people. He, starts, he stops well short of questioning the legal personhood of corporations, but he writes of the framers of the US Constitution, quote, unlike our colleagues on the Supreme Court, they had little trouble distinguishing corporations from human beings. And when they constitutionalized the right to free speech in the First Amendment, it was the free speech of individual Americans that they had in mind. The problem with Justice Stevens' dissent is that it does not fundamentally call into question the marketization of the political process. He hopes that envisioning society as a collection of individuals will make for fairer competition. But fairer competition is not the same as full participation, much less the pursuit of any real common good. To see society as a collection of individuals occludes the reality of class division and prevents any true attempts to overcome those divisions through a deeper kind of solidarity. We cannot begin to see the political process as a healing process for the weakest of our members. From a Christian point of view, we have a strong stake in corporate personhood. The church as the body of Christ is called to see the joys and the sufferings of all God's children as intimately bound together. The scandal of the rich feasting while the poor go hungry cannot be reconciled with the enactment of the body of Christ, as Paul makes clear in 1 Corinthians 11. The option for the poor is the church's response to class division. The church must furthermore be able to speak as a body and not as a mere collection of individuals. In the recent debate, over contraception and the HHS healthcare mandate, the government privileged the rights of individuals over the rights of corporate bodies like the church. For this reason, some within the church welcomed Citizens United as a vindication of the rights of corporate persons like the church to speak, but I think this is a mistake. 
The majority in Citizens United disavows any sort of distinctions among types of corporate bodies or indeed among speakers of any kind. The court thus claims to be blind to the exercise of power while eliminating the ability to make political decisions on the basis of anything but raw power. But Christians need not feign such blindness. There are important distinctions between class divided business corporations whose goal is the pursuit of profit and churches, unions, farmer cooperatives, nonprofit corporations, charitable organizations, credit unions, other bodies who can make greater claims to promote solidarity and common goods. To conclude then, the, the church's goal is to speak as a corporate person on behalf of the poor, to promote organizations of true social solidarity, and also to encourage businesses to pursue legitimate profit within the wider telos of an economy of love. As Pope Benedict XVI writes in, in his encyclical Caritas et Veritate, love must be, quote, the principle not only of micro-relationships with friends, family members, small groups, but also of macro relationships, social, economic, and political ones, end quote. What it means to enact the body of Christ in this context is not to despair of the state of corporate state power, but to build businesses and communities of true participation and solidarity. Thank you. Thank you.